You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today we have Tyler back on to talk about Lake Anna. And uh, the first thing I want to kind of get into is uh, he had, I guess, this epiphany midlife crisis. And you said, like, I'm going to become a guide. Uh, and he started High Pole Guide Service Lake Anna. Is that correct? Or is it just High Pole Guide Service? Yeah, High Pole. So like H-I-G-H-P-O-L-E. Uh, it's just a play on my last name. My last name's High Pole. And I was like, no one will ever say it wrong now again when they see the guide <laughs> service. So, um, But yeah, I I mean, hey, you're not too far off from the midlife crisis thing. Because I promise you, I'd way rather be out there doing that than sitting at my desk working when I Dude. currently do. Mm-hmm. Um, Pretext. And, you know, I enjoy it. I'm passionate when I'm out there and, and uh, I'm an open book. And the few, you know, clients I've gotten taken out, you know, actually one, the first official one on, on this past Friday was, was a listener, found me through that. And um, I mean, I'm throwing so much information at you in a five hour period um, that it's hard. And so I've actually write up little reports to PDFs, even with map knowledge. We go over everything. I give you all the settings. Um, Cause I'm throwing information at you. Like it is, you, you, you cannot process it on a day in the water. I can show you everything we're going to do, but I also give you a written report, a PDF at the end. That's pretty official. Um, I mean, the last one I gave, I even marked brush piles. So, um, you know, I, I'm throwing a lot of information out for people and people are like, Oh, you're burning your spots. But for me, it's, it's bigger than that. You know, I, I, I truly do just want people to catch more fish and fish effectively. And especially when it comes to things like live scope and those things that I'm constantly grinding at and I'm going to have a broken neck by the end of the summer. Uh, like, see, like it, it hurts. It does hurt. It's like, I feel like a, like an iPad kid, like staring down at, at a screen out there. But, um, but like, you know, we, it was a uh, Kemp Davis of so Kemp. If you see this man, I, I, I had a lot of fun with you. I, you know, he was very vocal that he learned a lot and, you know, we had a, we had a good time. And those sessions, you know, I break them down into to different sections. Like if you just want to go, your family, you want to have a guide trip, you want to go catch fish, we'll do that more officially. If you're a kid and you just want your kid to go catch, like I'll go put you on crappy or pan fish. Like I know that that's not as exciting as bass, but that's a great way to get people interested in sport, especially young kids. Um, or if you just like crappy and you want, you know, free dinner, we can go do that. Um, but I really like the, the live scope specific and bass fishing development trips on Lake Anna. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fish catching, we're going to hit some of the highest percentage spots on that lake that I know. So you have a really, like even Kemp, when we were out there, I mean, I think we were probably like eight for 10 on spots like that. He, that I was just showing him stuff. We weren't really even hardcore fishing it, but he caught fish, um, had a, had a really nice one come off actually on, on a dock, um, a little dock brush pile kind of combination thing. Uh, and then, you know, we ran through live scope. I got him a little comfortable throwing his bait, seeing his bait, what he's looking at, what settings to put on it. Uh, Dude, so it's, awesome. it's more, more of an informative session, but to me, if that's someone who wants to learn how to fish like Anna more effectively, that's what I would recommend. The fish catching is a bonus. And I, you probably will, because the stuff I'm showing you is such high percentage because I don't want to waste your time. Um, and then you get that written, written document afterwards, which I think is critical, especially for for weekend anglers, because I mean, processing all that information is hard. You have a document now where you can, uh, okay, that's what we did. And you have all the settings that you need for your live scope to get a really clear picture. It's so important when you're doing a business of, of any type, whether it is YouTube or you're starting a small time business or a guide service is value, bring value to your clientele. And I've had some guests on in the past where they don't want to talk and then they expect to be able to promote their brand. It's like, well, then why would people mm-hmm. trust you? Why would people care about you? Um, and, and I love how you said about the spot burning thing, because like I found out that as anglers get better, there's this peak plateau, I think, where you hit where you're just good enough that you don't care anymore. Um, you know, mm-hmm. McCluskey on the res classic example of that he will literally give up everything because he's like, I can still beat you. I just don't care anymore. It's like you ascend. I think that's really important for a lot of guides and people out there where it's like, you need to get to a point where you're comfortable enough that you're willing to have this information sharing. And when you do, you'll excel even more as a guide versus a person that's like, I don't want to talk to you about anything. I want you to be blindfolded, signed an NDA when you get on my boat. Why would I want to deal with you? It's just, it's yeah. not good business practices in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And like, again, I know that some of the people I'm taking out do not get to fish as much as me. And since I was 12, I have, I've fished 
more than most people because one, I'd go crazy if I didn't. And two, I've just had a lot of opportunities. And honestly, I, and some of it was just working hard to like get a boat at a young age and do all this stuff. Like I never, I wasn't someone that had things handed to me. So I, you know, I, I had to work for everything that I got on my boat and do all that. And I want other people to be able to experience that and go out on the weekend and catch fish. Cause I, I promise you, if you go out with me for a five hour session, the next time you go to Anna, you're not going to be like, what am I doing? Where am I going? And just, I'm going to go fish that bank just cause, um, and yeah, I agree with you about like the thing, like McCluskey and all those guys are really good examples. They are so good. And that's how I feel to a certain degree. If me and you go to the same brush pile, mm -hmm. just because I've been there a thousand times and I know what I'm reading, that's why when I take you, this might be your first time reading that. And if I'm not yes. open and honest with that, then what value are, are you getting out of that? But when I see it, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to figure out this fish just because I've done this hundreds of times, thousands of times, even on this specific brush pile. Um, so yeah, it is kind of like, you know, there's definitely a learning curve, but hopefully we can speed that up. And we will be getting into a fishing report guys here in a minute, but that is a perfect segue to another conversation, which was, uh, I think it's Milliken fishing. He posted a very interesting comment based on his early, his most recent bass open about what is the definition of a community hole? I think that's a fascinating conversation because I put that out there a lot and, and the Potomac river is ground zero for the way people. Uh, there's friction in how you fish that place. And there is basically a, a, a you know, who type of uh, culture around there of an in crowd and an out crowd. And so, you know, I wanted to talk to Tyler a little bit about this. Like, what is your definition of a community hole? Cause, cause to me, mine is really like public knowledge in area um, in general. And so what is an area? Well, Matter woman is a classic example of that. Like anyone on the planet can drive there and know from based on all tournament, basically results, Somebody in Matta Woman is in the top 10. Generally speaking, in every major tournament, somebody cashes a big check there. So you can know that and you can go there. Does that mean that guy's like, you know, you know, breaking up your hole? I just, I don't think so. And as we have more and more tournaments, Kerr had two or three tournaments on every week, including the Bass Open the last month. It was insane. I don't know how you have spots to yourself. And, and so I throw it to you, like, what is your vibe on all that? Yeah, I think it. It varies definitely from, uh, you know, spot to spot, like on the Potomac River. I mean, you got to have something really crazy to think that it's not a community hole at this point. Um, and I agree to that, you know, especially on Lake Anna, a community hole is more or less like, oh, this point typically has fish. Mm -hmm. It's more of like a point thing It's more of a community hole at Anna. Um, but it's hard. A lot of the stuff that I find and even like brush piles and stuff. I can't say like, that's my spot because I'm finding a brush pile that somebody else put there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, uh, I think a community hole is, is like what you said, public knowledge. And especially on like Tennessee river lakes and ledge fishing, like a community hole is a ledge. Like everyone knows that, you know, on this certain ledge at this certain time of year, when the current's coming, fish are going to be there. And so I think in the Milliken example, like I like him and I think, you know, he's awesome. He has a lot of doubters. So I think he has like a chip on his shoulder, but he went to a lake that from everything I know, fish is small and you have a bunch of practice with literally so, like the best anglers in the country. I mean, the opens are just as competitive as the elite series, um, if not sometimes harder to win because the field is so big. And if you find something one day, I guarantee you someone else found it one of the other days, especially on a lake that's fishing small. So to like, I think the community hole thing, you know, it's very subjective and depends on the body of water, but I do. Agree yeah. Yeah. It is so much about the body of water that you're fishing. And, and I, I had this conversation with Chris Gorsuch a while back um, about ethics as a boater. And I, it, it came down to, and we really could do a whole episode deep dive on just boating ethics as a fisherman, but it depends on the body of water you're on. You know, what you do at Lake Anna is probably different than the Potomac River. Like if I got to clo as close to you on a Potomac River grass flat as I did, if you're fishing a dock at Lake Anna, there would be an issue because it, it's, just, mm -hmm. it's, it's different. And I don't think people really understand that. It is a case by case basis. Now I, you know, full disclosure, I've not fished a lot of ledge lakes. I haven't. So, but I do agree with you that ledges, when you have a, a pure ledge tournament, like they used to have when Kevin Van Dam used to win at Kentucky Lake before the whole Asian carp issue and all that other stuff, those boats got bunched up because there's only so many juicy spots 
you know, on a lake for them to set up at compared to a, a bank beating tournament, let's just say, where it does spread out the field a little bit more. So, mm -hmm. yeah, no, I 100% agree with you there, man. It, it, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And like, it's just so I, I think the worst example I've had of this on the water was on the Potomac. And it's kind of funny too. like when you hear the spot I was fishing, everyone's going to be like, I mean, people you could literally like leapfrog from boat to boat certain times of the year and chicken monks and and uh i remember we were pre-fishing for a tournament this is forever ago and i i won't even call it the guy's name i'm sure if i told you the boat because he's got like a raft boat out there and i don't even know him but he um we both pull into chicken monks at the same time and he's going left and i'm going right and we're about 50 yards away from each other but we're going the opposite direction and he turns around and goes all oh, the places on the river and you choose here to fish and i'm like man i'm I'm late March on Chickamauxin. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> like, yeah. you know, I just, I brush it off. Cause I'm like, like, buddy, this is not, this is a, this is a community hole. Yeah. <laughs> this is, and we're going opposite directions. And then on Anna, like if someone pulled up when I'm fishing a dock and pulled up on the same dock, I, that, I'd probably say something. I'd be like, 100%. Yeah. What are you doing? But at the same time, if they pull 50 yards in front of me on the same dock, I mean, that's just, it is what it is. It's a small lake. And plus, I'm confident enough that I might be able to catch fish behind you just because I fish here so much. Yeah, and I think, honestly, a lot of these people have to grow up and understand that if fishing grows as a sport and we get more and more anglers into it every year with boats and kayaks, kayaks are a big issue too now, eventually you're going to have to learn that like it's public water you just got to deal with it because there's going to be too many boats mm -hmm. on a lake. And so I've always used the probability thing of, let's say if there's a, a thousand docks on Lake Anna and you have, you know, 1500 boats fishing that day, probability wise, there's not enough docks to go around. And so it's going to get a little pushy unless you just give up and go home, which is not going to happen. And I don't think people understand that when they get out there, that mm -hmm. it's changing. There's not just 10 anglers fishing anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And on Lake Anna, I guess this is, it's all kind of coming back to me now that we're talking. So I had an example this year and it was like, it's all, it's communication too. So there's a guy fishing, he's fishing on the bank, um, on Anna and I'm, it's kind of a main lake spot, but what people don't know, especially if you're not shading your map correctly, is there is like a huge massive flat in this point that pulls out that's way off the bank. And we pulled up, we were practicing for a tournament for that, for the TBF event. We make like one cast, catch a six pounder. I get bit and shake off, which was probably like another five to something. Mm. And that guy turned his boat to it. He saw us catch it. He turned his boat directly to us and started coming towards us. And in that instance, yeah, I don't, that's not like ideal, but we were kind of like, Hey, uh, are you fishing a tarp? Cause that's what I was worried about. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever, come get you some, come get a bite. There's a lot of, there's a lot of fish here. You're not going to catch them all. I'm looking at them right now on live scope. You might catch one or two, whatever. And I just, what, so what I do is communicate, Hey, are you fishing a tournament tomorrow? No. Okay. Just making sure. Cause we're going to start here tomorrow. And he goes, Oh, you're fishing a tournament. Yeah. And then he was respectful and didn't even come up all the way to the thing. And that was like, Hey, if you're fishing a tournament here tomorrow, I just want to know because we're going to be sharing this because, mm. you know, I found this the day before we came to check on it and actually shouldn't have even cast it. And we just caught a six pounder. Um, and it was just simple communication. Whereas if we didn't say anything, we'd be like, Oh, that guy's going to steal our stuff and blah, blah, blah. But he was like, okay, I got you. Like you're fishing a tournament tomorrow. Do you want to fish here? I'm just going to kind of stay off to the edge here and it's fine. And I, I even told him, Hey, if you want to come catch some, come on. And defensive fishing is so important. I I've ran into this when I'm fishing grass slots on the Potomac where, um, and you power pull down, you power pull down around the spot, let everyone come in because I call it like just the Jersey turnpike. You catch one and the circle just gets tight around you and mm -hmm. it, it really hurts people mentally. But what you got to do is just fish through it. Anchor down. Do not move. Do not leave your casting angle because people are going to give up. I think what people don't understand is when everyone pushes into your the area, the juice, it kind of, I think, messes up the fish a little bit, especially that shallow. But mm -hmm. it's still the juice. And so I think what will happen is as the boats leave and everything quiets back down, the fish will reset up and you can catch them again. You just have to have mm -hmm. the, the mental fortitude to be like, hey, I'm just not going to leave. I'm camped out on the angle and I'm just going to let them throw rocks until I get it back. And I, I heard of a guy that he just threw an anchor and pulled up his motor. And then guess what? They couldn't be within so many feet of him, which is brilliant. So like defensive fishing, I think, is going to become more of a thing like you did. Like, hey. This is my spot. I got to guard it. I'm just going to deal with it so he doesn't have the casting angle and until he leaves. Yeah. And it was no, uh, 
it wasn't anything like I, I quickly realized that this guy's just out here trying to catch fish. So I was like, Hey man, if you want to come, but what we started doing, I, I mean, we were being kind of dumb. We started just like literally doing three sixties on our trolling motor. And we were like, uh -huh. we're like yeah i mean if he is fishing tomorrow i'm just gonna turn up the big motor and just go Ooh. <laughs> and like, back and forth and i'm not serious I'm yeah, not, yeah, yeah. But like but um but yeah you do have to be defensive but as far as it communicating most people like kind of understand like we were like hey get away from here we were like hey we're fishing a tournament tomorrow this spot kind of just like implying this spot's kind of important for us tomorrow and he was like okay, i got you and then and you can analyze it too like it was a weird, it was a specific bite and stuff too. And like, if you see what the person's throwing and all that, like, yeah, fish will eat anything at any time, certain situations. But when you see like what someone's predominantly trying to do, you can be like, okay, you know, it's, it's not that big of a deal. What about boat number though? Like that to me is interesting. So let's say this is your mm -hmm. juice, but instead of the first boat out, your boat 50 out of a hundred and somebody's on the spot at that point, are you still going to be like, Hey, listen, I called dibs in this spot first, or is it just the luck of the draw? Yeah. Well, on Anna, on my, my boat on Anna's fine. Cause it's, cause it's fast. But if I'm fishing a big body of water anyways, my boat tops out in like the high forties. Cause I'm running a, an aluminum Ranger with not like a two fifty or anything. So to me, I'm just like, whatever. And I also, if we're talking specifically Anna, it doesn't really phase me because like I can go up and down that lake and be like, there's a brush pile. There's a point. There's fish. Yeah, like, I was getting at. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, like that spot, it, it ended up not even mattering a tournament because the conditions just completely one eight. Like that tournament was the, one of the weirdest, craziest, like hail storms, sun, rain, cloud. like it was, you couldn't even keep up with what the fish were doing. I think the fish were going <laughs> like, they didn't know what they wanted to do either that day uh so it turned out not being a big deal but if someone did beat me there and i knew it was that good i i would just creep in and then be like hey you know i practice here found some wait for them to leave i'm not gonna get like right up on you i'm gonna fish like this outside stuff but you also brought up guys and i hope listening to this on, on app again please guys like like and subscribe to the channel it really helps with the algorithm um you mentioned a really good point there where it's like, well, I know enough places to go. It wouldn't phase me. That was the first thing you said. And then it was mm -hmm. like, unless it's good. That's important because I feel like the people that complain the most about the community whole thing are the ones that only have one spot. They have yeah. one area and that's it. And they don't have any backups or secondary or anything else to go to. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so fascinating because I was like, if you learn a lake or an area, and I think this is what's important. And this is what's changed. in I think my philosophy when I, when you prefish, find an area of the lake that's holding them and break down that whole area. So you have places yeah. to go to and move to. You're not going to ever get in that situation where it's just one stump that you found them on and somebody's yeah. sitting on there. That's yeah. so important. No, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I think that is probably the most important especially in anna anna is actually very very easy like to break down into sections and to dissect it um and like what you said with population of fish on anna there's it's like any body of water there's a lot of dead water and if you just find a population of fish on that lake you don't have to be on like the one specific thing to catch them you could just need to be in a general vicinity or general area and hit high percentage spots yeah and, and that's so important too is understanding like how you break down your lake and what the juice is because it, it's fascinating to me and i keep going back to the story that there was there was like three kayak tournaments going out the same weekend and i had multiple winners on and the biggest thing was they won the tournament in different areas on different baits but the key was they found the juice there were other guys that fished the same areas as them, the same creeks, but they just came across the right group of fish. And, you know, if you're throwing the right bait, but you're in the wrong area, it doesn't matter. You've got to find the right population of fish that can support you in a tournament, period. Yeah. And it's such a simplistic thing. Like it's a no duh, Tom, but it's like, I think we overlooked that is like, we keep going through our tackle box versus being like, are there winning caliber fish here? And then figure out how to make them bite. Yeah, a hundred percent. It's always about the population of fish you're on. I'd rather be on fish and throwing the wrong bait than the other way around. Um, cause one, I mean, they're fish at some point, even if you're not throwing the exact right thing, you're still going to catch them and you can adjust. You can be like, Oh, I know there's here and you can adjust and make those adjustments accordingly. Whereas you're just throwing around and not even getting bit. You don't know, is this right? Is this wrong? And sometimes you stick things up, but really in reality, you're just in the complete wrong area. Mm -hmm. No, a hundred percent. And with that said, I, I did want to do a little bit of the tournament breakdown and the, the live scope before we get into the fishing report. 
you had a TBF event. I think that's fascinating because the TBF event, it's a bigger tournament trail. It's, it's a little, I would say it could be bigger than the Anna elite elites that, that go out of there. How many mm. boats were there with that body of water and, and how did the conditions adjust from practice to the event? Yeah, I'm going to be completely off, but I know a range, it was 65 to 70 boats. Um, pretty healthy for Lake Anna. Yeah, it was a lot. And it was an absolute grind, tough day. Um, the days leading up to it, uh, I, I mean, no joke, like me and my buddy and like he would attest to it. And even some of the people that like we like showed and stuff. So the day before that, and this is not an exaggeration, we made 10 casts and had 19 pounds. Damn. And we weren't even trying to do that. We were like, wow, we were like just trying to see if there's there. And we, I was kind of like, damn, like I wish I almost didn't even like, but like, that's the thing. We made like 10 casts mm -hmm. and had and had this. And it was because of conditions they were set up. It was more sunny. I know how the fish set up on Anna when it's sunny out there. I know how they set up like almost to a T, especially on the sections that I'm like really comfortable with. And we weren't even like serious fishing. We were more marking and I was like looking for extra stuff around areas. Um, and like, Hey, like let's just get one to bite here to see what kind of size we're dealing with. And it would be like a five pounder, four pounder, three pounder, six. And then my buddy caught a six pounder on the spot I told you about. And we were like, we just need to stop fishing because we made like 20 casts that day, like in total. And then in 10 caught 19 pounds. And this wasn't in one spot either. We were hitting, we were actually kind of running a pattern and hitting a high percentage thing in a in a general area of the lake. It wasn't like one population of fish that we were we were hitting a really a traditional type pattern that you could run in a, in an area. I didn't, you couldn't run it all the way up the creek and you couldn't run all the way to the dam. You could run it in the section of the lake that we were in. But then game day comes. <laughs> what yeah. happened with the conditions? It was so the morning started out like sunny and then it was like fine, but it was it was weird. And then a front rolls in. It's cloudy. It's it's raining and then it stops and then hail comes through Holy craziest shit. storm. We had to get under a dock for an hour like it was lightning by us. And I'm like, I'm in an aluminum boat and I'm sitting out here. There's lightning strike. It's hail. So we're under a dock. It's the waves are crazy. I split my thumb open. Dear just God. trying to gra grab onto a dock and um it was crazy i think like a lot of the field didn't even catch a single fish that day i know some people the storm was so bad that they had put in early um because they weren't sure when it was going to end at this point when the storm came we were like in contention uh we needed pretty much one really good bite or two pretty decent bites to actually get us in into that like you know top three range or, or even win it i mean we probably we were sitting on like on like 12 pounds, which I knew on that day with those conditions. I knew 12 pounds on Anna this time of year with these conditions is actually not bad. Like 12, like it's not the best, but it's it's not bad for what was going on. Well, let's get a little bit more granular. So the big storm comes in. Did you catch your 12 pounds before the storm rolled in that day or was it throughout the day or? We cold like 30 times that day. It was yeah. like ounce goals, ounce mm. goals. The big fish were just not biting like even the ones on like scope that i knew they were good fish they were just not they just would not bite and then after the storm came that's when that's when the bigger fish started biting i think we caught our biggest fish of the day right after the storm cold like two more times right before we had to go in and then yeah usually you i mean you always hear like pre-front is yeah. when you're doing it and it was it was it was a weird day it was you couldn't prepare for this day because the the water, the I think it was all down the east coast. of storm came. Like I saw, like SB was fishing on Lake Norman the same day of tournament, and it was hailing and crazy weather there. So it was just this weird, weird front. Like it, it was the craziest storm I ever see, seen. We looked across the lake and couldn't see the other side. I think that was the same time I was at Raystown, and I just was getting blown ass sideways, uh, yeah, with hail and everything. Well, with that said, did you have what pivots did you make? during that day when you're like oh shit our our initial thing that we found in practice is not working did that moment ever happen or you just re run the same thing but the big ones just weren't there this was one of those things where practice kind of hurt us because we had such an incredible day that i don't care mm -hmm. if it was like raining fire we were going to hit the same kind yeah. of stuff um and that just was not the deal and we learned that within 
I knew it. I, I had this thing going into it when I looked at the conditions and the pressure and the front coming in that it wasn't going to be the same, but I was like, I, I'm going to be an idiot if I don't at least try it. So we tried it for an hour. We caught a limit pretty quick, but it was like nothing. And then I was like, okay. And that's when I went back to, I realized what the day was. I realized I couldn't do anything crazy. They weren't like, they were roaming. They were constantly, ro- these fish were roaming. They weren't set up. They weren't, they weren't set up. I couldn't even go to brush piles, so I scratched that. And I said, I'm going back to fishing this lake, how I really learned how to fish it uh, over a year and a half ago now. I'm going back to the traditional ways that I learned how to fish this lake, and I'm going to get five bites. It was like a survival mode um, thing. And, and that flip, that switch just flipped as soon as I realized it. What happened yesterday is not today. No two days are the same, especially in that uh, like April time frame in, in spring. I mean, the fish are constantly changing in these conditions. Just had them really weird. And I, I talked to the guy um, who won for a while. We talked and stuff. And um, and what he said didn't surprise me, but it was a weird way uh, to win and not something that obviously anybody else was doing. And uh, but but I went back to just fit. I mean, I went I went fishing like you hear that. Like I just went fishing like I didn't. What I'm comfortable with is the midsection of the lake. I'm not on the bank. I'm finding something that's that's off a little bit in like the five to like 15 foot range. I'm fishing a brush pile. I'm fishing a shoal, a flat. I'm fishing a let. I'm doing something a little bit different. Even for that time of year, it might seem weird. I'm fishing islands and drop offs on islands and stuff. And I it just I couldn't do it that. And we realized that. And I said, dude, we're just going fishing. Now we're just going to use the baits I know. And we're going to go catch. A uh, thing that we should should add in for our listeners also is like, was this before or after you had live scoped this tournament on your boat? I had it on. You had it on? Okay, m- making sure. Mm-hmm. So how did that set up for it when it came to your decision making? Because when you said an hour and you left and the fish weren't set up, those those key words that now that I have live scope on my boat, it kind of, it, it, it jogged my memory. How much of that played into it that you were so quick on your decision making? Because you can aim at it and be like, dude, something's just not right. Yeah, I, I sped it up. Pro- I mean, I probably could have ran what we did just by having the day we had previously, I probably would have stuck with that for three hours before I was like, yeah, this isn't, but it was an hour because I knew the bait had moved. The bait was not stationary. The bait on Anna, um, that time of year, they are a little crazy because they're trying to move shallower and get spawned. But the bait on Anna, people almost think like bait are just random, but bait relate to structure. Um, And that is what they were doing the day before. They were elating and I looked and this bait is just, willy nilly they don't know what's going on either they're just swimming around the fish were on live scope you can tell when a fish is set up on something when it, it like especially on a brush pile you can especially when it's a good fish on a brush pile like they own that brush pile mm. that's the one big mark that you're seeing because they they don't let crappy set up on it they're not letting bluegill set up on it they're not letting little one pound bass set up on it and that's what we were doing the day before i mean it was one one fish set up on one thing they're locked in yeah they're locked in and that was not the case there i i, I noticed it really quick and i i w- it would have taken me definitely a lot longer without live scope so were you and this would be the thing that a lot of of people that are um not for live scope would say were you specifically sniping and targeting the fish that you caught or was it was it something else so yeah that's a it's an interesting thing so i i've done it but i don't it's just not effective for me. Like the swimming fish, the random suspending fish that's swimming. I definitely caught suspended fish, but not like chasing them down with my trolling motor. And yeah. Like, <laughs> like I know some people can do that, but to me, it's like, I'm just, this is going to like take me down some weird rabbit hole and it's just, I'm going to be wasting so much time and, and all that. So I, it's not like an individual fish. I'm, I'm seeing how they're relating to the structure and how they're setting up. Are they really off the bottom? Am I casting a bait to structure and seeing a fish rise, which that happens a lot? You might look at something and be like, oh, there's nothing here. Put a bait in there. Look at live scope. There's something there. Mm-hmm. It comes up. Are you seeing, are they on the, like on a brush pile, for example, sometimes crappy will do this. So it'll confuse you. But if you see a fish sitting on the tip of a brush pile, you're about to get bit. Mm-hmm. Like you, you're about to get smacked. And that's what I just did with actually uh, with Kemp on Friday probably the coolest eat I've ever seen on live scope oh, cool. was the fish were just, I, we went out there and I was like, Oh, they're set up today. Um, and you can tell that 
even on a stump too. Um, you know, how close they are to the stump. And people think if you see a fish just on that stump, throw to that stump. But if you need to see how separated they are from that stump, from that brush pile, from that dock post, because there's probably other fish around it. But that day, whatever the conditions are, they're just not like real tight up on that brush pile. Yeah. And that's so important because it's about how you take this information and how you use it. And, and, and I think it's important to know because there are some guys that are good enough. Um, McCluskey's one. SB is another one that they will snipe fish. They'll look on the screen and say like that one's five pounds and they'll force that mm -hmm. one to bite because they know if they get those five bites, they're cashing a damn good check. Um, but that's not always how you use it. And I, I kind of, I think it's harder that mid ground where it's like you, you approach brush pile and you see that there's bass on it, but they're not set up. And then it's like, dude, you see them. It's almost like sight fishing again. It's like, how long do you mm -hmm. give them before you're like, even though there's bass here, they're not responsive. I got to move. And that is, I think that's the harder skill to learn is, is, mm -hmm. is that greed that you tell yourself just one more cast, just one more cast versus being responsible mm -hmm. enough to be like, I'm out. This is not working. Next spot. Yeah. 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 I, I change it pretty quick. Like my approach is like a three bait approach. And like, usually what I tell mm -hmm. people just learning it is, um, if you're not bitten, like your first 10 cast, you're in a tournament situation and yeah you can tell a big a big bass and i'm a big bass from a small bass and you can tell when that, that fish owns that brush pile when that fish owns that brush pile you might want to sit there a little bit longer and I, that's what kind of what i explain to clients and stuff when i've been going out like i'll take them to the brush pile. You see, you see that fish you get that fish to bite you might break your pb that sort of thing and you know like if i saw that fish in a tournament i'm sitting here for a little bit longer than i would where if i see kind of like a dot here they're a little separated that's usually when you get like your clusters of like one to two pounders um but like when you see that fish that owns that brush pile you want to spend time on it and it's always a three three bait approach for me um as far as on anna i'm sure when i start using it on other places I'll, I'll change this up and that's usually a swim bait i don't mean like a big i feel like every time i say swim bait now people are like millican millican fishing oh, yeah 15 inch and sometimes it works but i'm usually throwing like a line through that's like five to six inches or i'm throwing a a vanessa swim bait over the top of it um that's my first and if they don't bite that then i'm throwing something more power fishing like a jig um even a carolina rig on a brush pile um and then i'm going to something more of a nest if they're not biting and that's like a weedless drop shot a shaky head or a net rig and then if they aren't Biting that, especially in a tournament situation, like when I'm out there learning or like fun fishing or trying to really see how this fish is going to react, I will sit there. But in a tournament, I mean, I'm making like 10 casts and a fish in a brush pile will tell you pretty quick, like, yeah, I'm going to eat right away or I'm not. And, you know, with my experience with this is your first presentation is usually your best presentation. Um, so your first cast is critical with each different type of bait and then your very first type. But uh, you can kind of tell based on conditions if I'm going to use a moving bait or if I'm going to go to like the shaky head right away. And uh, this past Sunday was a great example. That was the toughest day I've ever fished on Anna in my life was wow. Sunday. And if I, if I didn't have live scope, I would not have, I, I can actually say I would not have caught a fish that day. Um, and and that, that day was high sun, bluebird skies. Uh, the front came through on Friday and Saturday. It was like Friday was great. Saturday was it was waning. And then Sunday it was like, you better, you know, it's a grind. Like I, I probably caught 10 fish, but I would not have caught a single one without live scope. And it, it's just like, it, it, it's a time management thing though, too, because it is hard. It's even like with sight fishing. That's why I love sight fishing. It used to be like my favorite thing to do. But in tournaments, I like always try to get away from it if I can. Um, and that's kind of, with live scope, you just got to kind of try to be efficient with it. And then again, if you see one fish and it's like that, that fish is owning that brush pile. It's like, Oh, that's a five pounder on the bed kind of thing. Same thing. That's so important. Time management, time management. And that's where you do have to get out there with it and just use it. And, and mm -hmm. this always gets back to my, my other conversation I have, which is don't, I think for a lot of anglers out there, young anglers coming up, don't go out there and just fish tournaments every day. Because the problem is when you do that is you usually fall into bad habits because you're afraid of messing up. Um, this year, I think I spent more time. I fished three or tournaments this year, but then I've almost spent 
triple the amount of days on the water just messing around with live scope and learning it. And I think mm -hmm. that's important, whether it's learning live scope or a new technique, you know, don't just fish tournaments, get out there and force yourself one rod and you're going to learn you know, the spy bait or what have you. And that'll make mm -hmm. you a better fisherman. Uh, but those are just kind of like my thoughts on that. Uh, let's see. And the other thing I really wanted to get into, um, and this kind of goes, I mean, I think we should get into this right now is a fishing report because uh, it, it kind of ties in with wake boats because we are here and we are approaching, I guess, early summer. We, we really are in that, that, that post spawn into summertime kind of weather patterns that we're getting into right now. The boat pressure on Anna almost goes synonymous with, with after Memorial Day going into the 4th of July, right? Yeah, it's crazy right now. I mean, it, it is it was wild on Saturday. Like it was wild. And, um, that's like, you got to be careful out there. And I say this, like, not just like, Oh, go out with someone who knows the body of water or blah, blah, blah. Like if you want to go out there and you're fishing past like 11 AM, like you need to be careful, especially when you get up towards the state park and towards the splits, it's really narrow water and people don't care. And half the people that you're on the water, they're renting boats have like, it's their first time driving a, a boat. Don't know how to properly, you know, past people, yep. you know, starboard, starboard. They don't like, they don't know any of that stuff. Um, so that, that's something that, you know, especially if I'm going out with someone, uh, on the weekend now, I want to go out really early. Or if you want to go out late in the evening, cause it does calm down at like six, it starts to calm down. If you want to go out there and like fishing through the night, we can do that too. Um, but it, and if you want to do a full day, we can, but you'll see that I'm, we're not running and gunning to places very much. Like I'm not going to, have you bounce if it's myself i don't care whatever i you know i know what i'm doing but i'm not going to make someone feel uncomfortable uh, especially that's not you know used to that sort of stuff because it is it's no joke it, it is dangerous and you it's really not you it's just the people out in the water just not paying attention having a good time and, you know it's just their it's their right to use the water too but you know it's just it's a safe it is a safety concern after you know around noon noon through like 5 p.m 6 p.m is pretty rough out there what, what are the water temperatures right now? What are you seeing? Uh, so you're going to have everything's seventies, uh, but you're going to have like a variation depending on like main lake. Like if, if you're down by the dam right now, you're probably getting anywhere from 73 to 76, depending where you are mid lake. You're probably getting in the mornings, like a 71 and then it's going all the way surface temp up to about 77 to 76. Uh, and then up the splits and everything. I haven't really been super far up the splits, but the last time I went, it was like, it was like a 76 and it was like the middle of the day. Um, so it's probably, you're getting like ranges, the morning, the, the mornings and the nights have still been pretty cool. Like, I think when I was looking at the weather too, like it's still like in the low fifties and stuff some nights. It's really so weird. Yeah. Yeah. So your surface temperatures, it's still going to be in the seventies. It's gotten to that point where the whole lake is going to be, you know, a constant 70 it's just going to fluctuate probably between low 70s and to 77 degrees for probably the next week or so what's the shad spawn like right now and is there a decent shad spawn on like anna it's been weird this year last year it was awesome and it would go on like i don't know what it i i, I don't understand i know there's certain things that that kill a shad spawn if you get like a heavy rain over the night or something you you won't really see them spawning if you get cloud cover it'll carry on throughout the day and if you get like sunny stuff, you really got to be out there like before the sun peaks. Um, it is going on throughout the lake. It's really random. Keys for that are like, if I see like a single herring on the bank, I usually just keep going. If I see two herrings, I go there because they don't want to be next to each other anyways. Uh, so if you see two herrings, that's weird. Go go over there. At least see what you're dealing with. Um, loons, if you see like a loon or something uh that's another sign obviously if they're breaking on the surface i mean they'll be right up on it it'll be it'll be grass it'll be rock it'll be seawall um and when the fish are blowing up on them i mean there's you see like something's going on over there uh but you you've really got to be out early like i mean like you got to be like i think the best i've had it was like still dark like it was like 5 a.m or something 5 30. um most of the tournaments and stuff put out like past that like i think the the sunday series one at fishtails that I'll, i fish every now and then they put out like 6 a.m and it seems like this this year it's already, already dead by then hmm. um that's interesting if you get some cloud you'll still see it uh the water is up a little higher this year than it was last year so i think it's part of it is 
they have more things to spawn on and they're, and mm. they're a little more spread out. Last year wasn't as hot. It's not like a huge fluctuation. Like we're probably talking like six inches or something, uh, maybe a foot, but it's last year it was like it would go on to like 11 a.m sometimes and it would be like the sun out and you're like what and you'd catch five real quick that's crazy um but yeah it's still going on it probably uh will keep going on for a while here like i saw like a really strong one this past weekend super early um the herring too are kind of doing their thing on clay and stuff um and you'll see them on on more like that flatter stuff that kind of drags out into main lake and that's what's so interesting about this like is it seems like there's a decent balance of blueback and shad so you can almost have both and and you guys know from my other videos blueback are completely polar opposite of shad they prefer bright blue skies clear water to do their thing versus shad with the exact opposite cloudy overcast conditions for them to do their thing so if you're a bass it's nice because you basically depending on the section of lake that you're in where you have both you can basically get a top water bite hopefully no matter what the conditions are again mm -hmm. you know they don't read the textbooks but basically that's the vibe with that um the shad spawn is it if you had to pick a section of the lake broad terms like is it is it more consistent you know dam side mid lake or up i'd say mid lake uh the dam side it seems like it's spread out and it just seems more inconsistent like mid lake like all the way from the splits pretty much past the power plant a little bit uh it seems like you can key in foreign areas that they're going to be easier at least i've definitely found it that way um it's it's just more like if to the eye it's more visible where they're going to be when you start getting up into the creek stuff yeah they're still doing it up there but it just seems like you can kind of like i can like almost predict or just know from future stuff and spots like where it's going to happen um and it seems like when it's happening on the mid lake section too it's more it, it drags out longer uh anytime i've ran up to it up the creek and the narrower stuff are down by the dam it's like going on going on you get there you make a cast and then it's like done uh and then it seems like on the mid section for whatever reason i think it's just maybe like how how it lays out and where they tend to do it they're more like spread out and there's bigger populations of fish feeding and that's really important guys because again it depends on where you start your day and just by having that information it helps narrow down your approach to find out where, where the juice is um you know go, going through it if we go the same thing lower mid upper uh what kind of cover is in play right now in this summertime is it pretty much an offshore deal or is there a bank fishing opportunity for people that maybe don't have live scope yeah there's a bank fishing opportunity for sure um dock fish right now uh i was actually catching a few fish on saturday some fry garters on docks with live scope uh so like seeing the ball fry and then seeing the fish and it didn't even matter what you cast it in there i mean you could have cast that bear hook and it, like a two pounder would have bit it probably uh but the dock the, the dock deal is strong right now i i can i can actually skip and like i i used that's actually how i learned how to like when i was really i used to fish lake gas all the time when i was really little i used to be like our vacation spot um so like dock fishing and stuff there used to be really big um and like i can skip and all that but i tend to stay away from it but if you want to fish docks right now yeah i mean you'll absolutely catch fish um predominantly you're seeing a lot of the isolated stuff come back into play kind of like what you're you see in pre-spawn it's kind of you're getting kind of you know they're coming from the spawn and they're moving back to those things that they were staging on in pre-spawn and it's actually kind of weird because it seems like the big fish actually haven't even really gotten on that that mid-range isolated stuff yet it seems like they're still coming to it um so i think you're you definitely can beat the bank and catch fish on docks, but like isolated stumps, isolated rock and brush piles right now are, are definitely probably for like the next, I mean, into the summer, you can catch, a, you can catch a fish on a, on a 10 foot, eight foot brush pile all summer, uh, 15 foot and all that. It seems like the fish are relating to right now is this very moment, uh, eight to 11 foot is, is where you're getting most of your activity how much aquatic um i guess i don't even know what they call it the bank grass what yeah so support? yeah yeah that was the one thing i was gonna i was gonna get on because it is hard like when i say the predominant when i say the stumps and the brush and the isolated rocks and all that that's because there's so much more of that but there is grass in this lake and there is spots and you typically 
it, it, it seems to go one way or the other. It seems like you get bit and then your next cast, you pull up grass and you're like, oh, that's why. Or you pull up grass and then your next cast, you catch a bass. So it, it it's so sporadic. It's, mm-hmm. it's such, it's sparse. It's like there's random spots where it is like, there's one spot right now where I am amazed how good it is. Like, I mean, it is, it is good. I caught a, uh, I caught one just under seven pounds. It was probably like the last fish I posted on my Instagram uh on grass like lake anna grass and like five foot of water it was like five six foot isolated patch um and it was growing all the way out to 10 foot that's awesome um thank god and then and yeah and then even in the shallow stuff like there was one there was one weekend where it was like sun i don't know if like i don't know how this stuff works i'm not a biologist i don't know if it was like doing its kind of like underwater pollination thing but it was like nuts in this area like everything that you threw was just covered in grass and it was like everywhere what about that uh what about that bank grass too um that that you see growing at the at the splits is is there a lot of it this year that's going to be growing up is that going to be into play for like a buzz frog things like that yeah yeah it actually has i think i've caught a few topwater fish on some like uh main lake uh lake grass it's actually starting to get green and healthy right now um, I know up by past the splits and stuff, it's probably already been green and healthy. Um, but yeah, no, it is a player. I, I'm definitely seeing, you know, that, that is pretty healthy as well. It's in a lot of spots right now. Uh, the fish actually, so still right now, believe it or not, the main lake fish are usually the last to spawn and they they usually spawn in that stuff. Um, I've actually caught a few spawning fish, like sight fishing, main lake grass, um, at like this past weekend, like decent ones too. There's one I couldn't catch sat there for way too long. I wasn't fishing a tournament. So I was like, I'm, I got nowhere to be, buddy. <laughs> I'm going gonna, gonna to be here for a while. <laughs> and it wouldn't bite. And then guys, just to make sure that you understand what we're talking about. So basically, uh, SAV, subaquatic vegetation, that'd be your hydrilla milfoil stuff. What I'm also talking about here is like, you have this bank grass um, that, that'll pop up that you can visually see. And I think it's fascinating with that too, is because like Tyler was saying, the water is up six to seven inches. Well, guess what? On the up, the upper portion of the lake, that's huge because think about how much further Mm -hmm. those fish can actually get back in some of this stuff. And so that Mm -hmm. really will space out your bite. And just there in a strategy, there's two different ways to look at it. One is, okay, clearly the fish will use that more. That'll be on. Or you could look at it like, well, spread them out too much and it wouldn't be worth fishing up there because it'd be too hard. And so I think from just knowing that there's six inches of extra water in a place, you can defer two different strategies or approaching this lake. Very interesting. Yeah, the, yeah, it definitely does spread them out more into that stuff, especially right now. Like it, it's almost turning in some spots for a while. It was almost turning that bank grass into subaquatic grass and it was like green. And, uh, and that was kind of like what you want to look for. Uh, so if you're going on like on main lake, for example, and you're seeing that the water line is up pretty high and you're seeing the grass, it's like almost hit the water's like almost hitting the tips of the grass. There's probably still some below it that you're not seeing. And that's where you're going to get, that's where you're going to get bit a lot of the time. Is that stuff that you're not seeing? That's typically you would see if the water was that normal stuff and you just can't see it with your visible eye, especially if you're making a long cast. So this time of year, uh, June and in, going into July, what, what are kind of your baits? And let's break this down into let's, I think categories, uh, kind of like what you like to throw. And then of course, I just know there's so many people like doing this. What kind of baits would you throw into that kind of grass that you see on the shore or fish a dock? Yeah, I don't have anything I'd fish that grass. I mean, so all myself in my boat, but I do have some stuff that I can, I can show. Um, but if I was fishing that grass, uh, I mean, I'm probably am going to fish like something, some sort of top water, uh, whether it's like a buzzing frog or something like that, or like a, even like a swimming worm. I like fishing like one of my, my favorite ways to catch them, something crazy, just taking like a zoom speed worm and just swimming it over that grass, um, like weightless, mm-hmm. a, f- a fluke as well, uh, especially when you have like the shad spawn and stuff going on in that grass. It's hard to beat a fluke, uh, a swim jig, stuff like that. If you're like, re- if I'm really targeting that grass, I've usually got those things tied on swim jig swimming worm and then like a buzzing frog uh if they're like really relating to that and like the shad spawns going out throughout the day that's pretty much what i'm doing i'm just hitting everything like i'm i'm, I'm run through it pretty quick making a cask especially when the shad are spawning because if they're there they're there they're gonna tell you quick that's so cool awesome stuff sir and uh you said you did have a couple of things to show yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um we'll start with so this is my favorite and i throw like a bigger one uh probably 
probably the most are comfortable with out there, but on Anna, you're fine. Just oh, like I get it. Okay, there we go. Just throw in a top water, just a spook. This is going to be good from now until year round. This is actually sometimes, depending on the conditions, will be the first bait that I throw over a brush pile. Um, because again, it's just a quick way to draw attention. Like you throw this over a brush pile, they're going to immediately see it and they're going to tell you how aggressive they are. Uh, so this is like a bigger one. This is the Yozuri. This is a 3DB. Uh, this is like definitely the bigger one, the three hook one. You'll have no problem getting bit on the bigger one out there. It actually has to do with the herring and stuff. If you've ever seen a herring, they're a lot longer. Mm -hmm. Their profile's a lot longer. Um, so that is definitely all summer. All summer long, you can get away with throwing that on Hannah. And that's something else too, guys, when you're dealing with herring, don't be afraid to throw saltwater variations of the top water that are much bigger because a, a herring in of itself is, is really big. It's very long. Mm -hmm. And then this is, this is a cheap one because I, and there's nothing, nothing wrong with it. I got it because it's cheap because I freaking lose them so much, <laughs> but they still work. And this is just, this is the line through that I'm, I throw through. The, the tops of brush piles a lot. And this is just a big bite baits. Uh, yeah. Don't know the exact name. It's like, if you just look up big bite baits line through, it's the one you'll see. It's like a five inch. Uh, you can probably see it's translucent. That's pretty big for me on all of my swim baits and stuff, especially on Anna when you're getting to this clearer water. All of my swim baits are, have this kind of translucent look to it. Why would you go with, again, I know it's personal preference, but come on, like the whole craze right now is mega bass and that's that stupid mag draft. And so you buck mm -hmm. the trend by not doing a mag draft. Is there any reason mm -hmm. why? Oh, I still throw uh, a mag draft for sure. Um, but for some reason, I like that line through. I like my my hookup ratio. Mm -hmm. I know you can rig a mag draft. You could like do the freestyle and it's too much work. I just I have a bunch of those big bite bait and it works fine. I mean, I've caught a ton of three to five pound fish on that thing already in the past two weeks, just reeling it over a brush pile and they're cheap. When I lose a mag draft, I'm mad. When I lose that thing, I'm like, whatever, it's like four bucks or something. And it works fine. It, 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 it's definitely not the mag draft. You can, you can speed up your retrieve, slow it down. And it still seems to run a little more true. This one you do have to be a little more slower with. So I'm just kind of, you know, aware of that, but Again, I still throw the crap out of Mac. I'm not going to sit here and say I don't like, especially. Oh, yeah. Spawn. Yeah. And like the Mega Bass Spark. I think I probably showed everybody or last time we were here, the big Mega Bass Spark Chat and the blue back herring color. Uh, I I got some here. Ton, ton of big fish I, I catch on Anna all all throughout the year, especially yeah, in the pre-spawn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I run through those like like crazy, especially in the pre-spawn. That's like. Some, sometimes no matter what the condition, that's all I'm throwing. How do you like to rig those? Um, so I like that Fudoshita Yoda head thing, that spin head or. Yeah. So I'll use, sometimes I'll use like a bigger underspin. Uh, some people. So the, the one thing with treble hooks on a line through the treble hook, it, I don't seem to lose fish, but on a, on like a mag draft with a treble hook, I definitely have lost more fish uh, than that. So when I take a spark shed, I just use a jig head, like a pretty big half ounce to three eighths ounce jig head. And Mega Bass makes a really good jig head for it. It's hmm. like a balance, it's a balance head. Hmm. Uh, it looks kind of weird, um, but it keeps the bait perfectly balanced. Um, so you don't get any rolls or anything like you do sometimes with a soft swim bait. Uh, so I, I, that's what I, I, cause if, if something bites that, like I'm cranking, I'm not losing that fish with that single hook. It's getting it through the top of the mouth, like every time. Interesting. Dude, that's really good information then got two more and then there's one there's one bait i want to talk about because like it's not a secret but people just like don't throw it anymore and if you're learning anna it's probably the best bait to throw the chatterbait we well yeah that's definitely one but this one <laughs> this is just a drop shot right here so everyone knows like a drop shot Ooh. so really the only thing a little bit different about this one is like i'm not nose hooking it and this is just because i'm, I'm fishing a brush pile uh, and also you're, you're not going to lose, you're going to lose a lot less fish with a hook like this on a drop shot. I've noticed, um, and this rod in particular too, it might, it's a little bit stiffer than your typical drop shot. Cause when I'm fishing a brush by, I want to be able to crank it out. Uh, just so basically just a weedless version of a drop shot. And this is actually just a, uh, an offset hook. This is a owner, hmm. owner one-aught rigging hook. Oh, cool. And 
and uh i just found that i do not lose fish on this like i don't think i've lost a fish that's bit on that hook since i switched dude that's really cool uh now is that like more of a that looks like a power drop shot setup is that on a bait cast or bfs or is that on just a heavier spinning rod no it's on a 7-2 medium uh drop shot rod so usually when i'm drop shotting i'm throwing like a, a 7-1 to 7-3 medium light okay uh so that one's a 7-2 medium it does have a lot i mean it has a lot of a lot of give on it a lot of flex so you're like you're still going to keep the fish on, but it definitely has a lot more like crank to it, especially on a brush pile. Um, I, I just whenever I'm using like my actual drop shot rod and brush piles, I just have a tendency to one the fish is either going to come off or it's going to you know get me mixed up with that. I'm like 15 pound braid to 10 pound fluorocarbon, uh, three sixteenths to one fourth ounce weight cylinder or teardrop. I mean they both seem to be fine, and then just that owner one knot rig and hook um that, that's like my favorite drop shot like i don't know if i'll ever use it like i i love nose hooking a drop shot especially when it's like a really tough bite but i don't think if i'm fishing like cover or grass i think that's what i'll use and and you saw my leader for that i just changed my leader based on where i see the fish on live scope where they're positioning are they really tight to the bottom very short leader like i mean like a six inch leader sometimes um and then are they hovering off a little bit i'll go up to like a foot Foot that and is a half. so fascinating to me um have you ever thought about or do you just stick with 10 pound test or do you ever adjust up to 12 you know 14 15 pound fluorocarbon because you say you're fishing a brush pile and to me yeah. it's like like anna doesn't have dinks you know she's got some mm -hmm. pigs in it and so do you ever get nervous or is there times of years where you would adjust your your leader strength yeah so there was one time today on one of my brush spot this this freaking fish dude it like lives there or it's like a group of them where i literally just cut my thing and, and tied on a 14 pound leader on a drop shot and i was like i couldn't get to bite anything else but i knew this fish was big so i did that i still don't get it to bite it's this thing is like i've got i think it lives there and it, the water is so shallow where this brush pile is i was like i want to make sure this isn't a stupid carp so i went up and it it was a it was a bass and it was like not even afraid of the boat it was weird how large mouth are so like curious sometimes mm -hmm. like they like they like don't care he's like i don't care like it's my brush pile <laughs> so so i, I was like okay. okay um so yeah sometimes but i'm pretty confident in 10 pound leader uh especially with the trilene trilene 100 the gold box uh it has actually has a little more stretch than it than other fluorocarbons um and I'm not really, I, I don't know if I've ever broken a fish like with the line. Like it's always either been like a stu like a bad knot on my end and me just not paying attention to like a fray. But if you have, um, if you have like a 10 pound line or whatever uh, with that trialing, I just, I'm really confident in it. I think like even you'll see, I, I think it was funny too. I was watching like, it was like Lee Livesey or something. I think he was using like 10 pound fluorocarbon on Lake Fork and a bunch of trees. And you're mm -hmm. like, if this guy's on Lake Fort catch, catch an eight pounder on 10 pound line, I can catch an Anna fish <laughs> with 10 pound line. I think 10 pounds, like I used to drop shot with like six pound line. When I go to Smith mountain. I'll sometimes still put on like six pound line. I do think it's interesting that if you match your setup correctly, you can get away with it. So last year I spent an ungodly amount of time with BFS equipment and dialing that in. And now like for my shaky heads and for my like micro jigs, all I use is a BFS setup. And so I'm pitching and flipping with like eight and 10 pound test. And mm -hmm. just like what you said now, granted, like I, I pick my battles where I throw it, but you, it's so amazing when you match everything correctly, how you can whale on them and, and do mm -hmm. pretty well. And, and I think it's something else to, to tie into this about your leader length. You know, if you're fishing straight, eight pound test for an example and i've seen this that line is a lot more forgiving because no matter how good the knot is it's still a weak point um but the longer your leader is it kind of negates that a little bit how long is your leader generally speaking when you when you fish it? it it all depends on the fish how they're setting up and what i'm looking at um like on a bright sunny day like this is just general i get like i i feel like it's so hard to say because i could go out on a bright sunny day and the fish are chasing bait or they're doing something that's not like on the the bass handbook um so when i'm seeing them on live scope or even on 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 2d or side scan and they're like super super tight to something uh it's usually a shorter leader uh and i mean like real short sometimes like six inches um which to me that's always been really short because i feel like i feel like when people start fishing drop shots it's always like this really long leader it's almost like a little bit more than it needs to be um and if the fish are like suspending or they're holding off of it i usually raise it so like about a foot foot and a half um i've never done anything like 
I've seen some people for like two, three foot. Like, that's crazy. I don't do that. Uh, most of my drop shots are pretty short. I'd say between six and a foot. Now, one of the issues is when you're fishing at a braid to fluorocarbon, a lot of times is the fact that people don't know how much line to put on a much fluorocarbon leader. Oh yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. no, no. Cause this is like, this is a two parter question here. And so example is like when I fish straight fluorocarbon, you're amazed that you can set the hook pretty hard on eight. And it's because I think you don't have that, that knot there, but mm -hmm. I've heard people like Josh Douglas who up in smallmouth country and they will, they will pull on their spool, like 10 to 20 feet of fluorocarbon line to mm -hmm. they have. And, and I, their thought process is if I ever get short struck at the boat, the knots already in my reel. So I don't have to worry about that. Um, how much line do you, do you wrap up onto your spool? Yeah. So I always go, I tie my leader. Uh, I just tie like a, I think I just tie a double uni. I think that's what I call it. I'm, I'm so terrible with like, man, just double uni, super quick, easy. I've never had one. I've never had one break. It's always, it's always something else breaking before that knot breaks. Um, I I don't want I don't have time for the FG knot. <laughs> <laughs> don't, it's a pain in the butt. Yeah. So I um, so I, I tie the leader and then I reel down until the knot is right before my reel bail. Oh, okay. Is right before that. So that's like what uh, you got like seven, fourteen. That's like fourteen foot. That's that's a lot because I think that that's something that messes up a lot of people when they start doing fluorocarbon to braids. They don't put enough on their reel. And yeah. then when you set the hook, you get that jar. And a lot of times that's what's going to snap it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not really afraid to get it in my reel bail as much as I don't want the knot to be where all the guides are. Yeah. Because whenever you're casting, you're getting a weird thing. But if you get it before it goes to the first guide, it comes through a lot smoother. Um, but if you have like your knot where all the guides are in the middle of your rod or something, uh, I mean, you're asking for your, your knot to just constantly get chipped. Yeah. And again, check, check your knots be guys at home, like always check your knots to make sure that they're good. And as long as you have a long leader, you should be okay with it. And, and then to kind of tie back into the, the earlier question asked, play around with the length of your drop shot leader. Um, Aaron Martin's classically said, like he always kept his stupid short, uh, especially early in the year to where it's like, it's only like the size of your finger. And so that thing just bouncing mm. on the bottom. And I think that's important too, is he was a guy that never really fished a shaky head, but if it was more of a shaky head conditions, he still fished the drop shot, but he just had a stupid small leader. Uh, and I think it's fascinating because one thing I see with a lot of people is they fish their leaders too damn long all the time. And, and I, power fish a drop shot a lot where I'll flip it into beaver dams and stuff. And I don't have a 10 foot leader. It's really short. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of people don't do short leaders anymore. It's really weird. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I, I know like some of it is like probably from what you see when other like pros are fishing and like small mouth territory. I know that they're, yeah. they'll, they'll pull their leader up just with the way the fish are positioning. And so maybe that's just like what people see, but yeah, I would, I would not go, like it's different than like a Carolina rig, for example, like Carolina rig, like you can get real crazy with your length and there's like a reason for doing it, but a drop shot, like, and just like the way, especially on certain conditions, the way a fish is going to eat is it's going to like go down to the bait and stuff. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And then, so, uh, I mean, that's a real good kind of wrap up of Lake Anna right now. Uh, but there's another factor that we have to deal with with Lake Anna. And we see this at Lake Anna, Smith Mountain Lake a little bit, and especially at Deep Creek, pleasure boaters. And Lake Anna, if I'm, I'm mistaken, is about 9,600 acres of public water that you have. Uh, it's a major lake when it comes to a destination for people that live in D.C. and Northern Virginia, especially in the summertime, and we're getting there. And wake mm -hmm. boats and kayaks are a hell of a problem. So let's do a two-parter here. Part of it is like safety, of course, but then also like how do you strategize as a, as a bass fisherman? Because I know, and I believe you said this, once 11 a.m. comes, dude, the lake changes a lot, correct? So do you have to factor in a strategy when fishing of before the boats get on the water and then when they're on the water? Yeah. So just from a safety uh, perspective, so there is one thing that I just believe this is true from my experience. And then I actually recently heard, heard Brian Thrift talking about the same thing. I mean, if that, that's like, that's one of those guys, if he says something, you listen, um, but I noticed this too, is that no matter what's going on, if you're in a busy, busy section of the lake, the fish are still going to bite. They don't care. They're so, especially on Anna, they're so used to all that crap. Mm. What's, what's annoying is the mental part for you to sit there and get bounced. Like I almost got thrown off my boat this, this weekend because of like boat wake. Just, I, I was, I mean, I was fishing main lake, so I wasn't like hiding away from anything, but I was still catching fish. So you can still catch fish 
what the main concern is, is you just need to be safe when you're running. I promise you on Lake Anna and probably any busy lake, a lot of people just don't know the rules of the water. Don't follow it. And it can get very unsafe. And Lake Anna gets very narrow. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are just careless. So that is safety. But as far as fishing goes, I think one of my favorite spots to catch fish is probably one of the busiest, busiest parts of the lake. And um, I don't change there. The fish are still there. They're used to all that noise and all that stuff going on. And, you know, I was like this last weekend was a prime example of it. It was like two o'clock and I don't know, there's you got Larry on a jet ski and another guy on a pontoon boat and someone on a wakeboard boat coming right in front of you. And I'm, I'm catching fish on isolated stumps uh, out in the main lake. So, again, it's like a mental thing. I'm kind of doing it as a preparation thing. We have a two day event on Anna on June 3rd and 4th um for the state championship so I, i'm actually forcing myself to get comfortable because those are going until three o'clock so i'm putting myself in like kind of the most busiest areas to catch fish uh kind of as like a mental preparation thing i've heard a t matt allen talk about this too that actually you can create a fishing pattern based on having a lot of boat activity where you make you get those mud lines and that turbulence is that actually a thing or is that bs I have seen, I actually have seen mud lines created there from the wake. And like, you huh. know, like you fish like the edge of, I've never caught anything, but yeah. I have seen a mud line form for sure. Or like, so, I mean, I guess in some instances on that lake, it might even be the same effect that wind has on like pushing oh, algae, yeah. pushing algae to a spot that then pushes bait that then pushes the bass. Um, so yeah, you could see, you could see that as well. I could see that being a fact, especially on this. I mean, it's, it's worse than the wind. I'd rather be blowing 20 sometimes than all those boats out there. Yeah. Cause like just the washing machine effect, but you make it, that's a damn good point that yeah, if you get jet ski and wake boats every day in the summertime, I bet this fish get keyed into like, okay, it's going to stir shit up here at this part of the lake and mm -hmm. we can take advantage of that as a feeding window. Cause they're, the, they are smart enough to know that. I mean, if they know when a trout truck pulls up in, in November and the feedback is going, they know when that boat activity gets going, what it will do. Yeah. Yeah. And it'll push all of that you're getting a concentration of all of the microorganisms that the shad and stuff are, are pushing on because all that boat wake is pushing it to specific areas. And I know where like one of these areas is on one of the places I fish and it does seem like it is a good early morning spot, like before everything. But I know like when I go through there, I'm like, holy crap, man, I'm like, freaking my boat's going to sink because it's so rough. And then I, I kind of piece it together in my head like, oh, that's why everything's getting pushed here. It's like the same effect when you get on wind sometimes. Interesting. And then plus you don't probably have the pressure because no one would be crazy enough to be fishing, fishing out. Yeah. There. I mean, that's happening. <laughs> oh, and one thing before I forget, um, this is Ooh. just an example, but coming up here to the, uh, the blue, you're going to get a brim spawn and mm. it's already starting to happen. I've already seen some brim beds, but this is something, if you hear me talk about the bass spawn, I will be like, I don't think full moon has everything to do with it. But when you get into a summer, you talk about brim. If you get a full moon, they are spawning throughout the summer. Like, I mean, June, July, August, whatever, even sometimes in September, they they are spawning. And I mean, some of your biggest opportunities to catch. This is one of my favorite, favorite baits to to catch them. Oh, it's going to get in a glare. But yeah, that's one of my favorite baits to catch Ooh, them on. Jackal. Yeah. That one right there, if you find like a brim bed, I mean, the brim beds, you're going to visually see a lot throughout the lake. It just looks like little donuts or little holes like so like it just it's very obvious everyone's probably seen it it's like softer bottom it's not usually hard bottom like a bass um and some of your biggest fish in the lake position themselves on that so i throw that and then another bait that kind of got popular like i say unfortunately but it's going to happen regardless is the g crack uh bellows shad bellows gill that was that bait that like alton jones jr just wailed on him at bussy mm -hmm. but um i that's the biggest fish that I've caught this year was on a bellows gill hmm. in, gra in grass. Um, that was probably the last fish I put. That was the biggest fish on Anna I've caught this year. It was on a bellows gill. Uh, if you throw that around too, around those beds, you're, you're bound to, to get a big bite. And um, that's, that's really good to know that with the grass and the bluegill, because like lakes that have a high 
SAV population also really do well with perch and bluegill and brim and things like that. And so for all you homeowners that I hope are watching this, you know, it's, it's called subaquatic vegetation. It's not a weed. It's not something that needs to be like have pesticide dumped into the lake. Yeah. You need subaquatic vegetation to make these fisheries better. And it'll help with those stupid algae blooms that will typically happen at lakes that don't have it. So let's hopefully that we do get this good hydrilla or milfoil in there to where you get more bluegill. And then that means you're going to get even more 10 pound bass. So that's awesome. Yeah. yeah and clear water to swim in. Yeah. So I, I don't know why people want to get rid of it. I don't know why you want to swim in chemicals, but you don't want to swim in clear water. Dude. It doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't. Um, Tyler, if people want to book a trip with you so we can get you out of corporate America and into a boat full time, where yeah, please, they, please, <laughs> what can they do? How do they, how do they book a trip with you? Yeah. So look at my Instagram and then a Facebook page as well. Um, I could send you Thomas, if you want to put on this as well. Just click into that. My, all my numbers, all my contact information, all that you can email me, you can call me. Um, you can, you know, write to me on, send me a message on the Facebook page or Instagram whatever way you want to do it, but all that will be in my Instagram. And then I have a Facebook page set up for it. Don't have an official website yet. Um, I have a few trips, few trips planned, but uh, you know, for June and stuff, I'm pretty wide open. You know, we can go, we can get out there on a weekday too. Uh, you know, we can get out there, kind of beat the crowd. We can work around your schedule. Um, you know, if you just want to go out there and catch some fish, we can do that. But if you really want to learn how to fish Anna and you want to get comfortable out there, that is that is what I recommend is going out. It's cheaper than just a traditional guide trip. There's a lot more that goes into a traditional guide trip than than me. You still have the opportunity to catch fish, but you're going to learn that lake and I'm going to break it down for you. And you're going to have like a document and um, and I'll be a resource for you. I mean, you can call me uh, if, if you want to go over something that we went over or you, you forgot something. Um, you know, I'm, I'm an open book. Uh, once once you go out with me once and stuff, we can we'll have that relationship. And then guys link as always in the episode description, everything we talked about, including all of Tyler's social media handles, numbers, and emails. That way you can get in contact with him so we can give him some business. Uh, and then, yeah, we're going to have to check in with him after your, your state tournament here. Good luck with that. That's pretty awesome. Are you looking to win it or is it just like top qualifier to move on? Like what, what are you looking? Man, I want to win the damn thing. And I say that with like every single thing I have grinded on this lake so much that it would mean the world to me to win a bigger tournament like this out there. I've, I've every tournament I fished this year, I've no, I've not cashed a check on only one tournament of every fish I've, I've fished on Anna this year, but I have not had a win this year, even in the Sunday series. It just, it's just what wasn't meant to be. Or I, I do that. I get mad. And I'm one of those people when I don't do on a tournament, I, I take my boat back out there. I do not go home. So I went out there and I caught, that's when I caught my biggest fish of the year after a tournament. I cashed a check in the tournament, but I said, I could have won this damn thing. I, I messed up. I went back out there, I caught seven pounder and I said, I don't know if this makes me feel better or not, <laughs> but I want to win the damn thing. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm setting up to do right now. I'm spending so much time out there. I mean, I, I understand this lake better than I ever have. And I know what the fish are doing. I know where they're setting. I'm, I'm just crying. I want to win one out there. One for me, uh, it, it really is for me and definitely the people that have supported me and, you know, it, it definitely would, would mean the world this tournament's going to be huge i like that it's two day it takes the luck out of it a little bit mm -hmm. nothing that there's wrong with that someone shows up and catches them is what it is two days definitely favors you know the person who spent a lot more time out there we'll see how it goes it's going to be tough it is going to be tough i could very well zero and if i do that i'll i'll wear that on my on my uh shoulder just as i would if i won because you know it's fishing at the end of the day and it's it's june 3rd and june 4th on lake Anna. it's not the easiest time of the year to fish there I think you're ready for it. And I'm really hoping for the best for you. I think, I think this is going to be kind of your moment. You know, it's when preparation meets opportunity. And I think you're there guys again, please like, and subscribe to the channel it really helps us out with the algorithm. Please give us a listen on Apple or Spotify. You know, we just, we are every week we're in the top 200 fishing pot or outdoor podcasts that includes fishing and hiking in the whole world, which is pretty dope right now. And we are the number one fishing show in the greater DMV, DMV metropolitan area. We'll see you next time on fishing and DMV. Bye. You're listening to fishing the DMV. DMV with your hosts Thomas Aarons and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.